Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, so much for joining uh, today's Asian Impact Webinar. Uh, well, uh, we may have more participants because uh, uh, today we have lots of registration. So let me uh, start slowly uh, with this uh, uh, today's Impact Webinar on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and impact of small firms in Central and West Asia. Well, uh, uh, the in Russian invasion in Ukraine is everybody's concern. And then uh, we really co we conducted a short survey on the uh, mid, uh, micro and uh, small and medium-sized companies in Central West Asia. Uh, this is a part of our SME monitor. And uh, uh, this survey result uh, will be published as a volume two of uh, SME Monitor uh, for this year. Uh, today, uh, the survey result will be presented uh, by, the, uh, by uh, Mr. Shigehiro Shinozaki, uh, Senior Economist of ELCD. Uh, he is the author of this uh, SME Monitor, Volume 1 and 2. And uh, after uh, his presentation, uh, we will have panel discussion uh, so uh, the uh, the one, first panelist is uh, Ms. Kanon Kapan uh, Lao Area. Uh, she's the country director of a Kyrgyz Republic uh, resident mission of ADB. And uh, another panelist is Mr. Roman Modulevsky. Uh, he's a senior economist of our, our Central and uh, West Asia department. So. Uh, we will have a q and &A, a session i hope we receive some questions uh and if you have questions uh please put your questions in the q and a box or uh we probably can have time to take uh, questions so at the end uh if you have a questions please raise your hand so without further ado i'd like to uh, give a floor to shige so uh please start your presentation shige so good afternoon. So uh, thank you, Toma, and uh, thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. So everyone, so today, so it is my so great pleasure to talk about the so impact of Russian invasion of Ukraine on small farms in Central and West Asia. So this is a result of our so rapid business surveys uh, conducted in July to August 2022. So in seven Central and West Asian countries. Uh, okay, so this is the results so of our rapid business surveys uh, conducted in July to August 2022 in seven Central and West Asian so countries. So namely, so Armenia, Azerbaijan, so Georgia, Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, the large impact on businesses have yet to appear six months after the invasions, uh, but uh, we could see some uh, critical so, changes in business environment, so especially for small farms in the region. So taking this opportunity, so I'd like to highlight uh, key findings from our study. The detailed analysis is to be published uh, this year so, as the thematic chapters of this Asia SME Monitor 2022 edition, volume two. Okay, now let's start. So please, uh, next please. All right. Okay. So similar to other countries, uh, Central and West Asian economies were uh, adversely so affected by COVID-19 pandemic. A sharp drop of GDP growth in 2020, uh, but uh, uh, recovered shortly in 2021, uh, supported by intensive government assistance measures. So however, the recent Russian invasions of Ukraine negatively so affected the growth momentum of the regions with increasing inflationary pressures. So as Russia so was a major trade partner so of most Central and West Asian countries, the recent Russian-Ukraine so conflict so affected the region's economies and their so business operations, including so MSMEs uh, seriously. Okay. So oh, when looking at this response of Central and West Asian countries uh, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, two country groups uh, can be identified. 
So West Asian countries so with no anti-crisis plan uh, represented by Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. And Central Asian countries uh, with a set of action plans, so including so Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. In general, so West Asian countries uh, have relatively well coped with this invasion impact and related sanctions. So hence, they had no comprehensive anti-crisis plans at the time of the survey. Uh, they could partly so benefit so from the sanctions. Uh, for instance, uh, increase of tourists from Russia and Belarus, increase of new bank accounts, so in accordance with the relocation of Russian-based firms to this region, and also increase of so national revenues from oil, so with high prices and so on. Uh, by contrast, Central Asian countries had adverse effects so from the invasions and the sanctions. Thus, they initiated anti-crisis plans, so addressing the three pillars, uh, food security, uh, social protection, and business and employment support, especially micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. So firms in this country group so face a sharp drop of foreign trade with Russia. Uh, supply disruptions of imported foods and commodity, commodities, and also a sharp decrease of inward remittances, for instance. So to see the real impact on small farms, we conducted the rapid surveys in seven Central and West Asian countries, as mentioned. So because the sample size was different by country, so we use the pooling data so for analysis with two country groups that have different so impacts. So the analysis so focused on this so impact by farm size, uh, comprising the so two broad categories of micro, small, and medium large farms, and by sector, so with broad categories of agriculture, manufacturing, and services, and by country group. Uh, that uh, comprises Central Asia and West Asia. In the rapid surveys, we received a total of 903 completed responses from farms in seven countries, uh, which accounted for around 28% so from West Asia and 73% from Central Asia. Uh, the majority of samples were micro and small farms, 48% came from services, 33% so from agriculture, and 19% so from manufacturing. And samples included 26% from internationalized firms or exporters and importers. Okay, next, please. Okay, uh, six months after the invasion started in February, so around 44% of micro small farms reported no change so of a business environment, but 29% uh, felt worse business conditions before the invasion started. So indicating so surging production and so operating costs, uh, delayed product delivery and supply chain disruptions. Uh, meanwhile, some small farms around 6% reported a better business environment. Uh, by sector, this trend was more pronounced in manufacturing. Okay, next, please. Uh, for this chart, the difference of the impact by country group was calculated as a share of farms' responses in Central Asia minus that in West Asia, uh, which means a positive value, so indicates relatively so higher impact on farms in Central Asia. So far, negative value uh, shows higher impact on those in West Asia. So based on this, uh, for business environment by country group, uh, farms in West Asia were more likely to be split into two groups. And that is uh, farms that reported worse and better business environment as compared to those in Central Asia. Okay, for farms sales revenue, it was mostly unchanged six months after the invasion started, uh, but two groups were also identified. 
uh, those profitable and unprofitable. So especially in manufacturing and services. Uh, the share of profitable businesses uh, was small fractions of the survey responses, as you see. So by country groups, uh, firms in services so with a sharp revenue drop were more likely to be seen in Central Asia, uh, while uh, profitable micro and small farms were more likely identified in West Asia. Okay, next, please. For farms employment conditions based on the number of full-time regular workers, it was also mostly unchanged. But uh, both farms increasing and decreasing employees were identified. So especially in medium and large farms and manufacturing. So this suggests that some farms started adjusting the size of workforce to save internal costs or cope with the such demand on businesses. So this trend was more evident in farms in West Asia. Okay, next please. For working environment, a farm's survey started some internal cost controls. So including the reduced working hours and shift to remote working and layoffs. So given the prolonged invasion. By country groups, uh, farms' uh, internal cost control was more likely to appear in medium and large farms in the manufacturing and the services sectors in Central Asia. For funding condition, so at the time of the survey, uh, some small farms hold enough funds to operate, uh, while some already so no cash and savings or running out funds so within six months. The former was more evident in agriculture, and for the latter was more identified in manufacturing and services sectors. Next, please. So by country group, a firm's financial shortage was more evident in Central Asia, so especially in small farms and the services sector. So meanwhile, so farms enough cash conditions so appeared more in West Asia. So especially in medium and large firms, so manufacturing and services. Next, please. So this shows a farm's funding conditions after the Russian invasion of Ukraine started. So around one fifth or more farms surveyed, so had access to bank credit. So especially in manufacturing, so more pronounced in West Asia. Uh, but small farms still relied on non-bank finance and informal financing sources. So especially in agriculture and services, so more pronounced in Central Asia. So Central Asian countries offer the planned uh, so financial assistance to MSMEs so under the anti-crisis action plans uh, so that they can access to bank credit, so more with the concessional interest rate uh, through subsidized loans and or uh, credit guarantees like that. And nevertheless, uh, such financial assistance program uh, seem not implemented or not well utilized by firms in Central Asia. So our MSME surveys so also asked their concerns and obstacles in business operations. So I mean the ongoing so Russian invasion of Ukraine. So given the prolonged invasion, uh, their major concerns addressed high production and shipping costs. So payments and settlement troubles uh, due to the sanctions on Russian banks and also decline in future purchasing powers of people, uh, which means a possible sales decrease for the long time. Okay, so based on their concerns, so micro and small firms were more likely to consider so increasing the product sales uh, prices, so products selling the prices. So finding so new domestic suppliers and also seeking so concessional loans. So given the ongoing invasion, by country group, in Central Asia, so manufacturing was more likely to seek export volume expansion. So with agriculture and services, considering so product price increase like that, and in West Asia, so micro and small farms, so agriculture and services were more likely to look for new 
domestic suppliers. Okay, so this shows policy assistance measures that firms desired. As you see, a tax relief, so was the top policy measure desired by firms in both Central and West Asia. So it was followed by subsidy for Central Asia and deregulation on foreign investment in domestic MSMEs for West Asia. And subsidy was a third rank for West Asia. So tax relief and subsidy programs, if there was no exit strategy, so would damage national revenue and also brought the national budget further. So given the so prolonged invasion, the government may need to consider the more sustainable measures to support businesses affected. For instance, through so making the best use of public private partnerships uh, to provide more technical and business advisory and training. So this is about financial assistance measures uh, that firms desired. Uh, concessional loans were highly desired by firms, uh, followed by uh, zero interest rate, uh, collateral free loans, and also faster approval of bank loans in both Central and West Asia. So support needs for access to alternative finance or digital financial services like equity credit funding was identified, but so not in the high ranked so among firms surveyed. Okay, um, so this is actually the summary so of the discussion I raised here. So I skip this uh, because of these time constraints. So please check this later. Okay, next please. All right, so this is the last slide. So as discussed, overall, a Russian invasion of Ukraine has affected uh, business operations with different impact so in Central and West Asia. At the time of the survey, a tangible large impact have yet to be identified among farms surveyed, but the invasion, so impact, and also sanctions started creating two business groups in the region. Uh, farms hit the hardest and also those benefited. So as a lesson, uh, six key policy implications uh, can be extracted so from the Sosabe findings. Uh, first, so given the high reliance on imports of goods so from Russia, so it is very much critical to strengthen domestic commodity markets uh, through business clustering so to strengthen a uh, production line nationally uh, and to create the base of growth-oriented firms, especially micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises and entrepreneurships, so like uh, youth and women-led farms. So this would be so ideal to link up with national branding strategies of MSME products so they can expand exports to more diverse countries. So also the returning migrant workers can enhance national labor market or job creation uh, through providing continuous training and skill development for them. So promoting digitalization of MSME business would enhance their cost management and business expansion amid the crisis situation. For the finance sector, so given the increased number of Russian-based firms relocated to Central and West Asian countries, it is critical to strengthen the risk-based supervision in the banking sector with financial stability. So for instance, through developing a credit risk database. And the last three, so it is crucial to develop alternative financing options for viable MSMEs to access growth capital. So shifting so from subsidy-based finance to market-based finance, so like a capital market, and also digital finance platforms. Okay, so these are so six uh, major so policy implications we found so from this survey and this study. All right, so next please, I will stop here. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks uh, Shigei uh, for your presentation. Uh, well, uh, we will move to the panel session, but before moving to the panel session, uh, we received some of the questions. 
related to the country coverage, uh, definition of uh, MSMEs. And uh, so uh, please uh, provide a response through uh, Q&A box. Uh, and also the last question uh, regarding publication of this survey result. Yes, uh, we will publish as a SME monitor. Okay, uh, so next uh, I would like to uh, move to the panel discussion. Uh, so uh, uh, this panel session, I'd like to focus more on the uh, country specific case study. Uh, so the case of Kyrgyzstan first, and, and then I would like to broaden a little bit more on the regional uh, perspective. So uh, the first question is to Jem, uh, our country director of the Kyrgyz uh, Republic. So uh, the first question is, uh, what policy actions are ongoing or planned to support MSMEs affected by this uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine? And uh, also uh, some sanctions are affecting the uh, industries, particularly MSMEs in Kyrgyzstan. So again, the policy actions, what's the policy action ongoing or planned? So, Jane, please. Jane. Thank you very much. Um, from when this happened, the government uh, anticipated a uh, huge impact to the country. As you know, um, Kyrgyzstan is a small landlocked country with 7 million um, population. And out of that, uh, 1 million uh, uh, migrant workers, 90% uh, of that working uh, as migrant workers in Russia. So we anticipate a high impact from the reduced remittance. And also with all the sanctions from Russia with the close trading um, uh, relation, uh, the government has a, a launched a pro-poor counter cyclical development expenditure program uh, that's worth about 213 uh, million US dollars to respond to this uh, um, anticipated crisis. And in that, yes, of course, it's uh, targeted um, to um, the workers and also to small and medium enterprises. And um, the, particularly in the area of food security and agriculture, the government has allocated some fund to inject into the uh, agriculture bank uh, so that they can support um, uh, the small and medium enterprise uh, in, in this sector, that um, have to do with the uh, food processing and, and food security. And also the government also um, had issued a policy to uh, relax on the uh, requirements on reporting, auditing, tax uh, report of um, small and medium enterprise um, uh, to give them some, um, uh, some uh, room to breathe and during this difficult time. Uh, those are the things that the government has done for uh, initially and for ADB, we support this uh, initiative by the government as you know, on the 31st of October, uh, ADB approved 50 million US dollars for culture cyclical support uh, facility uh, for the government um, uh, program. Yeah, thanks, Jan. Yes, uh, definitely this uh, Russian invasion uh, really affects the Kyrgyz uh, Republic economy. Uh, you also mentioned the uh, sort of uh, remittance. Uh, so uh, my next uh, question is, uh, what is the, the current uh, situation of banking sector, banking, banking sector performance or financial market in uh, Kyrgyz Republic? Is there any serious impact uh, from uh, Western sanction on Russia, particularly kind of a swift disconnection? Uh, is there any impact on the Kyrgyz Republic? Um, surprisingly, you know, we were just have a, a big meeting with the IMF World Bank, and we were just saying that in the beginning of the crisis, we thought that it would, you know, we will face a lot of trouble. Uh, exchange rate went uh, devalued so much from uh, 80 um, some to 100, but um, the central bank is quite strong in Kyrgyzstan. They intervened quite quickly. And the bank sector itself coped, uh, I would say, relatively well in the fall of the international sanction against Russia. 
Uh, but there, of course, uh, a lot of risks, as you mentioned. Um, there are um, they would be require the, um, the the banking sector require targeted prudent potential uh, measures. And the bank, yes, they have like uh, correspondent banking relationships with um, uh, Russia, and but they also have um, the uh, corresponding bank elsewhere with uh, Korea and uh, and and um, in particular. But um, but um, there is a, a talk about continue doing uh, working on diversify. Uh, correspondent bank relationships in in the country in order to do this quite well, but the banking sector in 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 the country is still healthy. Um, uh, most the capital market is very small, so mainly um, all the activity is gone through the bank, and uh, uh, there's high. Um, uh, rising deposit rate in in banking sector, and perhaps this is something that you know we didn't anticipate before. Is there's actually a lot of inflow, and remittance is kind of difficult. We still, I mean, all of the economists in the region who who study this uh, area have to unpack to see what because the proxy that we use is money transfer, right? The money transfer actually increased. Uh, greatly and their high deposit. So there are remittance that are mixed in with the money that's coming from uh, perhaps from a uh, Russian uh, citizen who uh, want to do continue their activities here. There's a lot in the new wave of migrants from from Russia to to Kyrgyz and actually there are more in your uh, Chike uh, presentation, you know, in Armenia, Georgia. They also come to Kyrgyzstan because um, the Kyrgyz Republic is part of member of uh, EEU, so it's kind of easier in terms of a visa. So there are a lot of inflow of, of, of money. So it's seemingly uh, remittance is higher, but I'm sure later you have a, a very strong economy side, Roman will pop, pop we want to weigh in, in this subject later. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so, uh, well, actually, as Shige uh, presented, uh, there are sort of a different impact even among the Central West countries, uh, Central Western Asian countries, and particularly Kyrgyz Republic uh, seems to be affected uh, uh, largely. Having said, uh, the impact could be still kind of patchy, although government made kind of immediate reactions. Uh, still, uh, we see uh, some impact. Uh, and also, uh, we also see uh, some sort of resilience in the country. Uh, well, the remittance part is quite interesting. So we can't distinguish the, um, the workers' remittance and uh, sort of a uh, capital flow or cash flow from uh, Russian uh, people migrating to the uh, Kyrgyz Republic. So uh, probably we need to see the impact more carefully. Uh, so uh, let me uh, move on to the uh, the regional impact side. Uh, so the uh, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Roman. Uh, so uh, from regional perspective uh, and also your experience, what are key challenges of MSME's development in Central and West Asian countries, Roman? Thank you. Well, there are many challenges. I, I believe I, now I should concentrate mostly on those which are somehow associated with this uh, invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, let me mention just a few of them, which more or less uh, attribute, uh, you can see them in uh, almost all countries of the region. Uh, First, uh, high inflation, which was mentioned in the Shiga's presentation. That's actually very high, unseen in decades, like close to 20% in some, in some countries of the region. And of course, uh, governments and central banks uh, should do something with that, and they react as a as uh, theory suggests and as practice suggests, with increase of their policy rates. And this affects their lending rates uh, by commercial banks for MSMEs. You, if you look at statistics in different countries, you will see that average uh, uh, loan uh, interest, ra interest rates on loans increase by several percentage points in uh, almost all if not all uh, countries of the region. So the finance became more costly. It used to be pretty costly even before the invasion. Now it becomes some, some, sometimes prohibitively costly. And that's partially was reflected in the 
not partially, but actually basically a background for some of the results in the survey. So that's one, one challenge. Uh, another challenge is uh, interesting changes which are going on with trade, foreign trade of those countries. Um, interestingly enough, uh, many countries of the region, they report increase of exports to Russia. Counterintuitive because Russia well have some decline, but well not not so not so much as expected still. But uh, apparently, if you look deep into the structure of uh, exports, you will see that it is uh, very often re-exports, not the products produced in those countries, but rather products imported from China, Turkey, some uh, other places, especially from Europe and sometimes from the US, and then uh, re-exported to Russia because Russia is now cut off of some of those uh, sources for, for due to sanctions and financial interruptions. And uh, in a way, these countries, and especially that's the role for MSMEs, uh, to provide so-called parallel imports, as the Russians call, call those imports. Uh, and that's that's kind of a business opportunity, seems to be business opportunity, but it is kind of irregular business opportunity, distracting these, those businesses from their core business. So it's it's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge where may, basically, well, they may stop doing right things to do and rather concentrating on short-term things. And so there's also an, both opportunity and challenge is the inflow of people from Russia to those countries. And these people are different ones. Some people come basically, basically they are refugees escaping from uh, mobilization to Russian army. Some other people looking for more um, friend, for friendly business environment and for better connections to international markets. Uh, and that's a huge source. has a huge potential source of uh, of human power, uh, human uh, capital to the these economies, but it should be used, and that's uh, what countries now solving this, this problem with different. They all make who understanding is there. Governments do their best effort to attract both Russian people and Russian businesses to work in those countries. Also, some businesses which used to work in Russia but would like to stay in the region, they relocate to Kazakhstan, to Uzbekistan, to Georgia, Armenia. So that's another opportunity and a challenge. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the next question is uh, more sort of a specific contrast uh, between the uh, West and Central Asian uh, countries. As uh, Shige uh, explained, uh, there, are, uh, there is a different impact uh, on the uh, West Asia and uh, Central Asia uh, countries. Also, government reaction uh, is uh, different. Uh, so uh, in these sort of uh, you know, differences given, uh, well, uh, what is your view on the uh, policy direction, uh, particularly uh, in relation to the MSME development uh, in West Asia and Central Asia, uh, respectively? Thank you. Uh, the difference, well, let's consider, think a minute for what are the differences between those countries. Central Asian countries, except Kazakhstan, are low and middle income countries, very much dependent on workers' remittances. Both uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, they all depend on remittances. Sorry, uh, there was a question in the box about Turkmenistan. We don't cover it uh, because of lack of data. At least I, I couldn't cover it. Uh, so, Countries in the West Asia, in South Caucasus, they all are upper middle income countries, less dependent on remittance. They do uh, de depend, but to a lesser extent. And uh, it's for me, it is, uh, explains why Central Asian governments were very much concerned about the situation because, well, if uh, the expectations were like very dramatic in the very beginning, as Jim mentioned earlier, and so they uh, considered absolutely necessary to develop policy packages to address that. While for, it seems for Western Asia, West Asia countries that was less urgent and they decided to stay without any extraordinary measures in this direction. That's one possible explanation. 
Regarding the change, uh, well, the this content of this pack policy packages, Jim already described it in, for Kyrgyz, and I think that's more or less the same story in all countries. Support to employment and MSME development, support to pri uh, price controls through imports and the better supply of agricultural products and social protections. That's more or less in, in all countries' uh, mainstreams. That's a very interesting question, actually. I mentioned earlier that the interest rate, commercial interest rates increased. At the same time, governments increased supply of cheaper subsidized loans, which sounds like uh, obvious. But if we consider also, very frankly speaking, the governance issues in those countries, the increasing gap between commercial and non-commercial resources increases also temptation to use non-standard ways of uh, finding finance, if you, if you understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, and this leads me to the very big question. The governments made enormous effort in uh, reducing informality in those economies. That's very difficult. A lot of uh, careful, uh, scrupulous work is needed. And now we seem to have distracting uh, external shocks from, from that informality through this parallel imports participation or through new labor force with the irregular start is kind of encouraged. So it's really a challenge for the policies in these regions to return formalization back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, I'd like to ask kind of uh, the, the future uh, direction. And uh, uh, this is a question for both of you. So uh, what business model would be promising for MSME to grow under uh, this uh, kind of stressful situation? What factor uh, should government take into account to design the feasible uh, MSME policies in Central and West Asian countries. Uh, Shige already uh, mentioned some sort of the policy proposals, um, but uh, I would like to uh, hear your comments, uh, maybe starting from Jem. Yes, um, to, I think the uh, um, uh, it seemed like um, the supply value of supply chain is an uh, issue during this uh, and keep uh, make the government reflect on how to um, uh, look in inward. I, I would say like trying to source uh, many of the resource uh, better in the country and um, uh, instead of uh, totally relying on um, uh, uh, raw materials from outside and um, the, to, to increase the resilience of uh, small and medium uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, the government, uh, I think the, the good policy going forward, it's also to, to link uh, the skill, you know, instead, I know that a lot of, um, because there's no job opportunity in, in the countries, a lot of these, um, uh, there's a lot of supply of migrants who, who go out of the country. And for us in ADB, also our education policy or intervention in the country has always been uh, focusing on um, finding a uh, skill that would support um, private, small and medium enterprise, including just uh, simply uh, in, entrepreneurship skill because we, you know, the government support uh, any skill that would need anywhere uh, that would support small and medium enterprise in terms of running business and even financial management. And as well as the worker who do some simple thing like construction, design, um, uh, all those um, would be something that uh, should be uh, enhanced in order to uh, make uh, the, the, the small and medium enterprise uh, meet the quality and attract um, uh, investor and also uh, fulfill the demand of local uh, customers. And uh, not to mention that um, the country has to diversify, you know, of course, I think it, this one, I think coming through, in fact, in a high level too, and we see the attitude change um uh that uh, 
small, um, I mean, the former Soviet Union, I would say in the past year or two that I've been here, I feel like there are more uh, talks among um, uh, neighboring countries than before. Usually, it's I would say that there are stronger ties with Russian um, uh, federation with uh, individual um, former Soviet Union, but now it seems like within the different um, neighbors country in West A uh, South uh, East A uh, sorry Central Asia, and um, uh, there are a lot of traction on the bilateral relationship that has been setting up a fund like Uzbek Kyrgyz fund. Um, uh, you know, and and relationship with um, uh, yeah, bilateral with neighbor country has been um, increased in the recent time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Roman. Please. Well, thank you very much. Well, I really agree with what uh, uh, Jim just said. Uh, regional cooperation becomes even more serious than ever. Well, there was a co kind of comfortable model for uh, small entrepreneurs in, in Central Asia, also in West Asia, working with Russia, uh, common institutional uh, practices, co uh, very often shared language, shared culture, at least partially. Uh, so it was pretty pretty easy. Well, our last is now, well, I don't think, uh, I don't uh, want to say that it, it will be fully kind of canceled, but the development prospects of this kind of easy model may may not uh, be as bright as it used to be so it's not uh, really a, a strategy anymore so one option is really uh, look at domestic markets that's option for larger countries like uzbekistan like kazakhstan for smaller countries they still need to export and look for external markets and then this regional cooperation working for neighbors uh, uh, comes as the first uh, thing to, to think about. So it's, that's, uh, you know, ADB is all about regional cooperation. So it's uh, for us, it's even more work than ever. And But also uh, countries should uh, leave the zone of comfort if you wish and go to difficult markets, but attractive ones, uh, European markets, Chinese market, in South Asian markets, uh, which are less known, require more effort, require better calculation of risks, but also providing more promise, especially in the longer term. So governments must support that. And also, as I mentioned already, I, I think it is an important point is that uh, to operate on those re more remote and more kind of less understandable markets, you need to be more formal, you need to be better prepared, have better legal expertise, technical expertise, uh, language expertise, that's, uh, and that's human capital dimension mentioned by Jim is really in, uh, should be supported. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I suppose the uh, support to the MSMEs, uh, actually, uh, what you just have heard is uh, kind of a basic approach, how we can support the MSMEs. Um, but uh, probably uh, this sort of uh, uh, situation really push the government to do more. And also, uh, quite interestingly, uh, some of the regional cooperation aspect may be added. So I'd like to uh, go to the uh, questions from the floor. And uh, the first question is the, uh, well, uh, so the uh, the uh, practices uh, uh, in terms of uh, how we can shift the, the uh, from uh, subsidy uh, based uh, uh, sort of uh, financing to market based financing for SMEs. Uh, Shigen, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, and uh, given the current situation for uh, Central and West countries. Uh, this may not be easy, but uh, do you have any suggestion on this? Thank you, Tomo, and thank you very much for the comment. So actually, this is a very so important so question, and then every government is uh, uh, seeking this uh, good way so to so move so smoothly the, so, uh, from the uh, you know, subsidy-based finance to market-based finance. Uh, but unfortunately, so at this moment, if not mistaken, my uh, from my experiences, 
uh, there was no good examples uh, successfully so, uh, moving so to the uh, market-based financing. So, but so many developing Asian countries are trying to do that. So, for instance, introducing this so cash flow-based financing or uh, some sort of the so asset-based financing. So, they are so very te technically oriented so financial product uh, they are developing. So to smoothly so shifting so from the subsidy based to the so market based, um, maybe uh, so next five to so ten years. So some things, uh, new trends of the so sophisticated financial market uh, could be seen so in the so developing Asian countries, is including so Central and West Asian countries. Uh, but uh, so before doing that, the most important infrastructure will be in so data infrastructure uh, created. Uh, data infrastructure, especially. So related to this, I think the, so, uh, it is critically important so, to develop the so, credit risk database uh, to understand the so, you know, riskness so, of the so, MSMEs uh, so, to provide the credit. So this is the so, basis for uh, promoting the uh, cash flow based financing. So there's so many infrastructure still needed to be developed so, in many so, developing Asian countries. So, okay, so uh, that, that's my so, comment. Okay, so yeah, so the uh, shifting from subsidies to the market base, probably technology support may be necessary. Uh, the next question is on the, uh, for the, the issue related to the migrants and uh, returning migrants. Uh, so do you think uh, uh, they can support the development of a more sort of a knowledge or high skilled uh, industry or how those returning migrants can contribute to this uh, industry development. Uh, maybe, uh, Roman, do you have any comments on that? Thank you. Well, first of all, there are different uh, migrants uh, coming into the country. Some of them indeed deserve the name of re returning migrants, those from Kyrgyzstan, for example, returning to Kyrgyzstan, those from Georgia returning to Georgia. As, as some of them are, well, let me make a reservation. We don't see many migrants, uh, labor migrants returning back to their countries due to this crisis. That was expected, but we don't observe that. However, we, for example, we, in Kyrgyzstan, I know there are people who uh, for, worked in Russia long, they acquired Russian citizenship, and now they escaped because they don't want uh, to have anything to do with this war. So those are returning migrants in the way. And those people who are accustomed to the local labor markets, they are pretty well positioned to contribute in the mean, uh, well, depending longer term, it's difficult to assess because we don't know the outcome of this uh, political crisis. But even in the short term, they are prepared to, to join the labor market and with their acquired skills, maybe as entrepreneurs, maybe as more skilled workers. So that's, I see, see quite a positive. Uh, those Russian Russians <laughs> uh, who come to these countries again, uh, some of them may find good niches for them also. Well, as you know, in Kyrgyzstan, they even introduced special legal category of digital nomad basically inviting people to establish IT businesses in Kyrgyzstan and with very good conditions and trying. So there are attempts. We will see what uh, what would be the outcome. It very much would depend probably on this general situation, what is going on in Russia, but I, I'm pretty optimistic on that. Other people who come with uh, salary expectations and uh, skills which uh, diff uh, difficult to find the satisfaction on uh, more poor mar uh, labor markets of, of more poor countries, then perhaps that may be a challenge if it goes for too long. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, next question is on the regional cooperation. So they can regional cooperation central Asian business and uh, uh, regional logistics development be seen as an opportunity? If so, uh, what should be done uh, to support it? Can I ask a question to Jen? Uh, so the how, to, how regional cooperation help this uh, particular central Asian context? Thank you. Yeah. Um... Yes, um, regional cooperation, will def, um, uh, especially going through um, our 
help uh, through Kyrex program, ADB support the uh, Central Asia Economic uh, Regional Cooperation Initiative. Um, we have been support uh, various area um, to, to promote private sector development um, and uh, cooperation in terms of trade facilities. Um, as you know, there are um, uh, trade uh, efficiency is especially important during the COVID time. There's a lot of um, um, uh, bottlenecks. And with a good uh, understanding and clear agreement uh, among the countries uh, who, through the regional cooperation, that will improve the, the flow of um, uh, goods and passenger. And um, uh, with that, uh, it will improve the bottleneck. Um, regional cooperation also have to look in the um, um, in, to, in terms of the round uh, connectivity that um, uh, members countries start to, to look at um, option, different option. You know, the um, uh, trade route usually even from, from uh, Kyrgyzstan usually go through the north to Kazakhstan. Now, yeah, you probably seen a lot of news about the government uh, renew uh, in, enthusiastic about alternate route. And uh, there are talks about the big project that hasn't be, has been put on hold a long time, but now there's a, um, a, a renewed uh, interest such as um, uh, the uh, PRC, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan railway. And then also there are a lot of uh, trade routes um, that have been discussed to, you know, um, to be alternate uh, route so that the trade and the um, passenger um, throughout the region has been, can, can be connected uh, with, with more option and less obstruction in, in case of um, crisis that just happened. Maybe this object, a subject also, Roman, probably more yeah. uh, an expert. Thank you. Yes, uh, but uh, let me move on to the another question. Uh, this is uh, uh, also interesting. Uh, so they related to the remittance. So the uh, Armenia remittance increased 70% and the economic activities uh, really growing. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> so is there any risk? of this kind of uh, uh, inflow uh, to, I guess uh, this is to the uh, West Asian uh, countries. Uh, can I ask the question uh, to uh, Roman and maybe to Shige as well? I think I will try to be very quick. Well, uh, we know from the theory, if uh, you have too much inflow of foreign exchange from any source, from exports or from remittances, this will cause uh, Dutch disease, uh, which means uh, excessive appreciation of the national currency, uh, which may uh, reduce competitiveness of uh, manufacturing exports, for example. So that's, uh, if it continues, well, it may be short term one off effect in Armenia and Georgia. So now it is 70% increase, next year it will be 10% increase, then no major uh, effects should be expected. But if it will be persistent, then yes, uh, it will be a challenge for the central bank and for the government to address it and to sterilize in a way, which is, wouldn't be easy. Also, the inflow of high-skilled uh, labor is an opportunity, but it's also a pressure on the labor market. And again, it may be squeezing out uh, skilled uh, Armenian, Georgian, and other workers uh, from the labor market. So. Uh, we need to watch very carefully what is going on. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just for uh, my perception about this increase of the remittances in Albania, it's actually it was so caused by this Russian government, so restriction suspended so for the uh, so Albanians uh, uh, so uh, in workers so in Russia. Uh, which means remittance not yet uh, not yet to be uh, suspended. So then the so remittance increase continues. So in Armenia, that's my understanding. So it's a very special cases. So but there's a, a volume of these remittances. So will be so depending so on these Russian regulations, it's still very volatile. So then the government so needs to so consider these more domestic based so economic growth models, not highly relying on these you know uh, inward remittances from Russia. 
So uh, there are so many so issues uh, to be developed related to this. So also the so domestic so markets so should be so developed. So with the so more uh, sophisticated so branding strategies, national branding strategies of MSME product uh, to strengthen the so MSME competitiveness further. Uh, so this is actually the so, uh, very important. It's uh, so very so, um, so good timing. So for the countries to consider uh, the restructure these so business models and also uh, policy support measures to uh, private sector businesses, especially for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, this is so closely related to this model of overall so macroeconomic so growth and uh, resilient so economic so growth models. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, well, there seems a few questions left, but uh, uh, we need to close uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, well, uh, just to make sure that the, this year, uh, we focused on Central Asia, uh, last year, South Asia, and previous year, uh, we also did for the Southeast Asia. Uh, so we try to cover uh, the region one by one, uh, but we also provide the data for SMEs uh, through our uh, website. Uh, so if you want to see those sort of uh, time series, you can have a look uh, from our website. And for this year's publication for SME Monitor, uh, focusing on Central Asia, uh, we will publish soon. Uh, so you can also see uh, the information. And then the, uh, I guess there was a question related to the, how the SME can be uh, become more so the informal sector to the formal sector. Uh, this is a difficult question to answer, I think, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, through uh, SME Monitor publication, uh, you can see a bit of a clue uh, how we may be able to help the SME uh, development. And lastly, I'd like to uh, inform you uh, this AB uh, Asia Impact webinar uh, series continue. Uh, so uh, for the uh, the next uh, Asia uh, imp Impact webinar, uh, the, the topic is uh, investors and underwriters' perspectives on sustainable finance in ASEAN. Uh, this is also another interesting topic. So I hope uh, you can also uh, see you in the next uh, AI, uh, Asian Impact webinar. So I'd like to express my appreciation to Shige, uh, Jem, uh, Roman uh, for your participation. And I'd like to really express my sincere appreciation to all the participants. Thank you so much uh, for your participation.